Tonight we're going to be looking at 1 Peter, the very last three verses. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. We're going to read that in just a minute. But here we are at the end of this letter that Peter was writing. It was a letter that had some very serious uh, subjects that he was talking about, and we're going to talk about those in just a few minutes. But when you get done writing a letter, when you get done t talking with someone about a weighty subject, one of the things that you want to do at the end of that conversation or at the end of that letter is you want to draw it to a close, close in a way that will help hopefully emphasize the purpose of your letter. And as you read this closing, you can definitely see that that's what Peter was trying to do. Under inspiration of God, he was trying to pull these things, these different themes that he had been talking about together and help them see how it all fit together. So we're going to look at that today, tonight, as we look at this, these last three verses in the, in the book of 1 Peter. As I was thinking about this passage... And I was thinking about the book that we've just been working through really over the last year. When I first started looking at this, I thought, I was thinking, man, I'd really like to be able to spend some time and just kind of help pull all this together. And then I was looking at all these names and things, um, you know, these, these closing greetings, and I thought, wow, you know, it looks like, I, you know, maybe I should do this, and then next time we'll, we'll do a summary and as I was looking at the, these last three verses, I realized that Peter was doing some of that himself. And so, to, and so instead of me summarizing this passage for you, it would be much better for me to let him do that for you and show you what he was talking about. So we're going to do that tonight. Let's look at those last three verses. Verse 12, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, it starts out saying this, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Mark, Marketh, Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray and we'll, we'll get into this passage. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that when you wrote this, when you worked through men like you, like us, to put your words down on paper, Lord, that you knew exactly what we would need. And I pray that you'd help us, even as we look at this passage, Lord, to realize that whether or not we think right at this moment this is what we need, we certainly do need your word. And we do certainly need to hear from you. And we certainly need to be prepared by your word for the things that may come our way. And so I pray that you would help us to have open ears. Lord, help us to come hungry to your word. Help us to hear what you have to say for us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. This passage that we're looking at is certainly the closing words of Peter. And I wanted to start out, I, I wanted to show you two things tonight that, that, that are really the, the thrust of this passage. First of all, there's some people involved in this final greeting. And then there's some truths that Peter wants to get across in this final greeting. So I'm going to, first of all, look at these people. And I think there's some, just some wonderful things here just, just in, in, in the people that are involved. And then we're going to look at these truths, these final truths that he really wants us to see that sort of summarize this book as we come to the end. So first of all, we have uh, several people that are involved here. You see in verse 12, you see a guy named Silvanus. And you may recognize that name, but you may recognize it less than you think you do. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then you look down on in verse 13, you have the church that is at Babylon, and you'll notice that it actually, some of those words in that, in that part of the verse are in italics, and we'll talk about that 
And then you also have Marcus, who he refers to as his son. So these three people are people that are involved in this final greeting. And when you're writing a letter, and if you're, you're talking about someone else, um, maybe in the greeting, you know, my wife wants to say hi, obviously this is something that's special. These are some, somebody that you have a connection with and that they have a connection with. And so Peter includes these under, under inspiration. And so let's talk about this. First of all, you have the man Sylvanus. And uh, this man Sylvanus, you, you, you'll see in several other places in Scripture, you'll see in some of Paul's uh, writings, he talks about the same man Sylvanus. Um, but you also know him by probably his nickname, which is Silas. You remember the man named Silas who was chosen by the church to go with Paul with certain letters from the church for the Gentiles. That's the same man here that Peter is sending with letters to um, other churches from where he's at. And uh, it says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, I have written briefly. Now, as you look at that wording, you might think at, at the beginning that it's saying that maybe he wrote it out for Paul. And that's possible that he wrote it out. But this particular wording, it says, I have written briefly. Uh, by Sylvanus, I have written briefly, is the phrase. When you see this in different passages, it actually means, that particular wording actually means that this person is the person who is carrying the letter. Now, it may be that he had written it out, Paul had dictated it to him. We don't know, but what Paul is specifically saying. And the way, reason we know that is, for, for example, in, in uh, Romans, you talk about, I think it's Phoebe that he says, by Phoebe I send this le you know, I've written this letter. But later on he also says that another person had actually written it out for him. And so this particular wording is saying that Sylvanus is the messenger. Now Sylvanus, he describes him as a faithful brother. If you were sending an important message, you'd want to send someone who is faithful, someone that's trustworthy. You know, so it's not like they come, show up with this letter and start reading it, maybe it's their own letter. And so, so Silas was someone who was earlier even sent out by all the apostles to deliver a letter along with Paul, who also certainly was involved in many missionary activities. But here he's, he's delivering a, another letter for one of the apostles, and that's for Peter. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was, I was looking up a, a little bit of information about Sil, uh, Silas or Silvanus. And um, in some of the older artwork, um, when they would draw, when they would have pictures of some of the different um, apostles and things like that, we don't know what those men looked like. We don't have any pictures. And one of the things that they would do in, in, in some of the older artwork, because we have no idea how to identify them, we don't know, okay, you know, George Washington, we kind of know what he looks like with the wig and all that. They had no idea what he, he looked like. So one of the things that they would do in some of the older artwork is try and it, include something in the artwork that indicated who he was. And with Silas, the thing that they would normally do is have him holding chains that were broken. Do you remember why? Because that night in the prison, after they'd been beaten and thrown into this dungeon, Paul and Silas spent the night singing and the Lord did a miracle. The Lord opened the doors of the prison and instead of all the prisoners running away, Paul and Silas said, hey, we're all here, don't kill yourself. And was able to lead the jailer and his family to the Lord. And so Silas was known certainly to the church and certainly to believers for that particular thing. But he was someone that was indeed faithful. And that's certainly something that all of us can aspire to. We can't all be, you know, some super leader that everybody knows for the Lord. But one of the things we can aspire to is being faithful. And that was what Silas was known for. And that's certainly something that we would want to be known for. Also, another person that's mentioned, or a group of people that's in, mentioned, is this church that is at Babylon. It says, elect to get, elected together with you, 
saluteth you. And uh, that certainly brings up some questions because we're talking about in the time of the Romans, when the Roman Empire was, now he's talking about the Church of the Babylonians. Now I believe at that point Babylon wasn't even hardly inhabited. But really what, um, you know, as, as we look, look at it and try and figure out what he's talking about, there's a, there's a phrase that comes all the way back from the Old Testament times. When someone would refer to the Babylonians, it's talking about the, the head of the world system. There was a time when Babylon ruled the world. The world system was ruled by Babylon. And Peter here is probably referring to the city of Rome as the head of the world system. But as he refers to it as Babylon, he's making a point, and that point is that they were, you know, that when the Israelites were in Babylon, what were they? They were exiles. They knew this was not their country. And Peter was mentioning this, and really this was something that would, he, you could almost say that the entire church was a church that lived in Babylon because it was in this world system and it was not their home. They were not members of this world that seemed to be ruling everything. They were different people. They were distinct. And certainly that's something we need to remember in our own time. Bible calls us, you know, God calls us to be people that are different from the world. God calls us to be people that are light and salt in the world, but are not part of the world. In fact, earlier in, in, in Peter, he's talking about how they were strangers. And so, even at the end, he's reminding us of that fact that we as believers, believers who God is, it talks here as, as elected together with you, that we are people who are not supposed to look at ourselves as part of this world. We're supposed to look at ourselves as strangers and pilgrims, as aliens, in the, in the sense of, this is not our home. We have a home that's in heaven. And we're going we're gonna to see how, how Paul re, re, reminds that in a few moments, reminds us of that in a few moments. And then lastly, he talks about, and so doth Marcus my son. And this really kind of puts a, a, a little bit of a final cap, almost, on the story of Mark. I, every time I think about the whole story of Mark, it just, um, you get these little pieces of it throughout Scripture, you know, throughout the New Testament. And then at the end of that, you have this book, this gospel that Mark wrote. And so I just want to remind you a little bit about who Mark was. First of all, Mark was probably a very young man, very likely a teenager, when Jesus was around on the earth. Someone who apparently had come in and out of, of the picture when Jesus was on earth. Many people believe that the young man who fled away naked when they went and grabbed him in the garden was Mark. So you have Mark who's a young person, a very young person in the time of Jesus who fled. Then you have him, you see him a little bit later with Paul and Barnabas and he was probably a nephew or some relation to Barnabas. And he's traveling with Paul and Barnabas and at the end of this missionary, this, this one missionary journey, there's a rift that develops between Paul and Barnabas and that rift is because of Mark. Apparently, there was something in Mark's life that Paul was like, you know what? He's not worth having with us. You know, maybe he was, maybe he was lazy, maybe he was scared, maybe he was, um, he just, he, you know, when, when they got done that first uh, missionary journey, Paul said, look, he's not coming with us anymore. You know, whether he referred to him as dead weight or, or he just thought he had some, you know, spiritual problems, Paul was saying, yeah, it's not worth it. And so at that point, Paul and Barnabas split apart. Barnabas went his way and went, continued teaching the word. Paul went his way. And it seems that certainly God was working in all that. And Paul ended up going with Sil uh, Silas or Silvanus on the next missionary journey. 
Then you see, you see this. You see, well, actually, um, you, you see how Peter is apparently with Mark. How Peter calls him his son. And it really makes me think. It makes me think of a few things. One is, the Lord was working, obviously, in Mark's life. And the Lord was obviously preparing him for greater ministry. Even through the hardship of being rejected by Paul, which may have been legitimate. I mean, it probably was. There's probably something serious that, that, that was of concern to Paul that, that made, it, made it where Paul couldn't travel with him. God was working to restore Mark, to strengthen him in the faith, to grow him, even through that. And here you see Peter calling him his son and saying, Mark salutes you along with me. Really commending Mark to them. And then later on you see um, Paul even talking about how Mark has proven himself profitable for the ministry. And at the end of all that, you see Mark writing one of the Gospels. In fact, some people, um, uh, you know, we all certainly have different passages of Scripture that, are, that uh, people love, but many people have, have chosen Mark as a way to just share the Gospel going through because it's a shorter Gospel. It's 16 chapters. You know, many people have, have actually used that as, as their evangelistic method, doing a shorter Bible study in, in a, one of the shorter Gospels. But I, 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 it makes you wonder, what was Peter's part in that? You see him calling him like his son. I mean, there's obviously a tight bond. Many people believe, because Mark would have been a very young man, that some of, some of the uh, parts of his gospel probably were things that he had heard directly from Peter. You know, was Mark there for everything, or were things that Peter had shared with him Parts of what filled out Mark's gospel. Because there were certainly times when it was just the 12 with, with Jesus that, that Mark was referring to. And one of the things that, that, that's made me think that may have made a difference in Mark's life is, is certainly Peter's influence. But you think about Peter. What happened to Peter? There, at the, there when Peter was before the, uh, you know, watching Jesus being questioned, and Peter denied the Lord, and the Lord restored him. It seems very likely that Peter was part of the process of restoring Mark. Peter knew the difficulty. He knew the failures of his own life, and so was able to help others. And it certainly is true many times that even in, in our own lives, that as we see failures that we have to work through, that the Lord may use us down the road help others in those same failures. And so sometimes people who are very discouraged, you know, Psalm, in, 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 one of the, in the Psalm 51, one of the things that, that uh, David says is that, you know, at some point, you know, he's, he's praying to the Lord, he's, he's asking for forgiveness, he's, he's asking him to restore the joy of salvation, and says that I may again give praise to you among others. And God can do that work. And it, it's a joy to see that, that Peter saw the worthwhileness of that. And we eventually had a gospel written by this young man, Mark. Now there's a truth that's embedded in this passage that you find right in the middle of verse 12 that I think is really the core of what Peter was trying to remind us of in this brief closing. And it says this. This is the phrase that I want you to see. It says, Salvanus, a fellow brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. In fact, that word wherein ye stand is actually two small Greek words, and it's eis ein, or ein, and it would be, you could translate them, in it. The, the word wherein is really two words that mean in it ye stand. 
One of the difficulties when you're going from one language to the other is every language has different word orders and things like that. And uh, in this passage, it, it seems like um, this wherein is almost a little bit soft because he says we're exhorting. And at the very end, the last word is stand or stand firm. The very, and it's, it's the word uh, stay te, um, which means to stand or be established or be um, just kind of like rooted in place. Sometimes it's just talking about a crowd that's standing when you, when you use that word. Other times it's talking about standing on God's word or standing on promises. That's that last word. And, and so many of, many of the commentaries and, and, and translations actually just say, stand in it. So he's exhorting them, this true grace of God, you stand in it. Now what is this grace of God that he's talking about? If you look at 1 Peter, one of the things, and as we've looked at it, one of the things that you see going on over and over and over again is God talking about this grace that, he's talking, that, that Peter just refers to one more time. And he says, I'm exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. And I want to go back. I want to give you a quick reminder tour of these different places where he's talking about this grace of God. And I believe he's really talking about the initiating grace of God which also bears fruit. So let's take a look at that. First, uh, first Peter, let's go back. We're going to take a quick tour of it. Look at, first of all, chapter 1. There's several places where he's talking about this grace of God. Really, it's the gospel. Verse 3 in chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of, cre of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. This is kind of like one of the, the beginning salvo of this whole book, where he is just rejoicing in what God has done for us. All these things, this inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away. And he's applying it to this idea of suffering. And over and over again, you see him talking about the gospel or what Christ did for us that gives us this grace. Look down at uh, verse 18. Verse 18 through 21, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver or gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of this world, but it was manifest in those last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Here he's talking about how we're saved because of what Jesus did, and he's telling us how that should result in our lives being purified in verse 22. You see it again in verse 9 of chapter 2. If you just re scan down just a little bit more, he mentions it this way. He says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a peculiar people. That's that same idea of being not part of this world system. That ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Here you have a little, little piece of the gospel, and he's saying that because of what Christ has done, you are supposed to be people who show forth his praises. A little bit farther down in verse 21. Again, he, he brings out the gospel and, and uses it and, and applies it to them. 
Verse 21 of chapter, 20, of chapter 2. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to them that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were sheep, as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Here, he's saying that Christ's sufferings are our example. Throughout here, throughout this book, we, one of the major themes is suffering. But here, particularly, he says the way Christ suffered is an example for us. Christ suffered in a way where he did not sin. He loved those who even caused his suffering. And he's saying, this is our example. In chapter 3, he goes a little bit farther. And he says that make sure that when you suffer, you are actually suffering for righteousness, not for your own sins. So look at verse 18 of chapter 3. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, that when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that was eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure also wherein to even baptism, talking about spiritual bath, baptism here, doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here again, he's drawing our attention to the Gospels. He's pointing out the fact that we need to make sure that when we suffer, we're not suffering for our own things. We're suffering for the things of the Lord. And then in chapter 4, verse 13, He says this, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He points out the fact that even as Christ suffered, and at one and, and the Bible is clear, you know, one of the things that God says about Jesus suffering, and you can look back into Philippians, it talks about how for the joy that was set before him. Even as Christ suffered for the joy that was set before him, when we suffer, we need to remember that there is joy set before us. Even as we partake, he talks about us actually having part in Christ's sufferings. And he draws a connection between that and us also being partakers of the joy of eternity with him. And so that when we suffer, we are actually building up future joy with that. That certainly connects us even to that first passage where it talks about that inheritance that we have that's incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. But it also ties us right back to this end where it says that he is testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. One of the fallacies sometimes that we have in our own Christian life when we look at the gospel and I say this even thinking about February, the month of February, we're going to be hearing some gospel messages. And I would encourage you, when you come to the services in February, I hope you don't look at it as we have messages for those people who are going to come who need to be saved. I hope you'll be able to look at what Christ did for you and grab a hold of those things, realizing that same thing that saved that, that will save, has the power to save those who are without him, is the thing both that saved us and is the thing that empowers our living for the Lord. The Bible is very clear that, that the gospel is not just for the unsaved. The gospel is the power that we have to continue to live in obedience for Christ. Each one of these passages draws from the gospel both as motivation and the power to obey God. And here he's saying, this grace, this gospel that has been shared is the power to stand as well. In fact, you know, 
depending on how you put these words together, it's even stronger than that, that because of that, he commands us to stand. It's the gospel that empowers us to stand. It's the gospel that motivates us to stand. And so really, as we think about what Christ has done for us, as we look at his dying on the cross for us, as his resurrection, the power of that resurrection, we need to also realize that that is the thing that makes it possible for you and I to obey Christ. Do you know that it is absolutely impossible, and the Bible's, Bible mentions this in many places, that no matter what kind of good deeds we do, it is impossible to please God on our own. There's absolutely no strength in us. The Bible's clear that it's because of what Jesus did for us that we can possibly please God. And there's many ramifications out. Part of it is that when we get saved, the Bible says that Jesus' righteousness is given to us, and he took all our sins upon him. So when God looks at us, he sees his righteousness. Beyond that, it talks about Jesus' righteousness in us makes it possible. We are a new creature. The Bible talks about us being a new creature. And so then we can finally actually change. Because of that, Paul tells us we can put off the new man, put off the old man, and put on the deeds of the new man. And so really, here he says, the gospel is the power, the gospel is the start of all this change in our lives. Is it natural at all for us to rejoice in sufferings? Is that a natural thing? When you start looking at the Christian life, there are many, many things that you see in Scripture. And if you just sit down and look at it, you're going, yeah, that's not normal. That reaction is not a part of normal human experience. And yet when you see what the Bible both tells us to do and what the Bible helps us to do, you see that God is in the business of helping his children be far from normal. God wants us to be different. God calls us, he empowers us to be different. And it's his gospel that's the difference. So we see a truth that Paul, uh, that Peter wanted to leave us with us, that it's the true, it's the, that it's this true grace of God wherein we stand. It's the gospel that makes it possible for us to stand. It's that firm foundation wherewith any other foundation is sinking sand, but that foundation is the foundation which you can stand and you can see the Lord work in your life and change you and make it possible for you to do things that are impossible otherwise. It's that foundation that even as he's talking about these, this joy that Christians can have in suffering, even as Paul talks about how you can have a peace that passes all understanding when you put your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that's what Peter is saying. This is the place. The gospel is the place where all of that starts and where all of that ends. And so we need to realize, we, we, we just need to, we need to encourage our hearts when we hear the gospel. When we tell it. Have you ever noticed sometimes when you're telling the gospel to someone, you, how, excited, how excited you get and how, how it warms and encourages your heart? We're, we're, we're giving God glory whether or not someone else receives it. And it's something that we need to be telling ourselves, we need to be teaching ourselves, we need to be encouraging ourselves with, is that grace of God. I loved some of the phrases of those, those two hymns we sang. You know, that through those fiery trials, trials that are described here, that we stand on his firm foundation, being the gospel. At the end of this passage, he has a few final words. 
In verse 14, he says, Greet ye one another with the kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And certainly in, you know, when, it, when it talks about this kiss of charity, it was talking about something that was part of their particular um, culture, that they would kiss each other on the cheek. You've seen some of the Middle Eastern cultures. But one of the things that's clear is that we need to be greeting each other warmly. How that looks in our, our church is probably a little bit more like a handshake or, or maybe, maybe, uh, maybe ladies giving each other a hug or things like that. But God wants us to be able to greet each other and care for each other in the church. And then it says, peace be with all you that are in Christ Jesus, amen. God calls us to be people of peace with each other. It's not always easy. The same power that can empower us to go through fiery trials certainly, certainly can give us the ability to have that peace. And so I, I want to encourage you as we close this, close this message. When you don't see the power in your own life, to do something, or you, you see something, you're like, I don't, I don't know how I can do that. Where do you turn? Do you turn to all the kind of different motivations and things that, you know, reasons why you should do something? Or do you turn to the power of Christ Jesus through his death on the cross to raise, be raised from the dead and to raise us from the dead of sin. He's the answer. We need to turn to him. Let's pray.